on the night of December 6, 1991, Austin, Texas, was forever changed when four teenage girls were brutally murdered at a yogurt shop in a seemingly safe neighborhood. What began as an ordinary evening shift at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt Shop spiraled into one of the most chilling unsolved crimes in Texas history. Just before midnight on December 9th, a call came in about a fire at the yogurt shop in northwestern Austin. Fire crews would arrive at the scene a short time later to extinguish the fire, but inside would make a heinous discovery. The bodies of four teenage girls who had been shot execution style and then set on fire. The victims were identified as 13-year-old Amy Ayers, 17-year-old Eliza Thomas, 17-year-old Jennifer Harbison, and Jennifer's 15-year-old sister Sarah. Jennifer and Eliza were the shop employees, while Sarah and her friend Amy were in the shop to get a ride home with Jennifer after it closed at 11 p.m. They had all been shot in the head with a 22 caliber pistol, and at least one of them had been sexually assaulted, but all had been found undressed. Sarah, Eliza, and Jennifer were all gagged and bound with their own underwear and had been severely charred by the fire. Unlike the others, Amy's body was found in a separate part of the shop. She was not charred but had sustained second and third degree burns on 25 to 30 percent of her body. She was found with a sock-like cloth around her neck. Like the others, she had been shot, however, the bullet had missed her brain. A second bullet caused severe damage to her brain, exiting through her cheek and jawline. According to some reports, she was still alive when firefighters arrived at the scene but died moments after their arrival. At the crime scene, investigators discovered that the yogurt shop's back door had been left unlocked, likely providing the culprit or culprits with an escape route, as the front door was locked and the keys were later found inside. Additionally, $540 had been stolen from the register. The last transaction recorded in the register's log was at 11.03 p.m., three minutes after the shop's scheduled closing time. This transaction was marked as a no-sale, indicating either a cancelled transaction or that the no-sale button had been pressed to open the register drawer, likely during the robbery. After committing the murders, the killer or killers started a fire using paper plates, cups, and cardboard soaked in lighter fluid. The fire, along with the water used to extinguish it, destroyed many clues that could have aided the investigation. Reportedly, the fire burned so hot that the victim's teeth and jewelry began to melt. Despite the damage to the crime scene, investigators found a partial DNA profile with 16 genetic markers, which is insufficient to incriminate anyone but could be used to rule out potential suspects. On the night of the murders, at 8.15 p.m., a customer reported seeing two teenage boys near the entrance who made her feel uneasy. Hours later, a former military police officer entered with friends and noticed a young man acting oddly, ordering a soda and disappearing toward the back of the shop, where the restroom was. Other witnesses saw two men sitting near the register around closing time at 10.42 p.m., both partially obscured by jackets. These individuals have never been identified. During their investigation, detectives initially focused on four teenage boys, Robert Springsteen, Michael Scott, Morris Pierce, and Forrest Wellborn. Pierce had been found with a 22 caliber handgun and initially confessed to the murders, but detectives released him, finding his confession unreliable. In 1999, eight years after the murders, authorities arrested the four, now adults, in connection with the yogurt shop slayings. After police interviews, Scott and Springsteen eventually confessed to the killings. Scott was sentenced to death, and Springsteen received a life sentence. However, the Texas Court of Appeals overturned these convictions, ruling that Scott and Springsteen hadn't been given the chance to cross-examine one another. Both men were released on bond in 2009, and the charges were later dropped. Over the years, law enforcement has obtained false confessions and investigated over 1,200 possible suspects in the murders. Despite these efforts, the decades-old case remains unsolved.